we want to remember the upcoming uh, VBS that's going to be taking place at the Church of Christ in Rowlett. Uh, Brother Ray Hunter will be giving the adult classes. It's going to be August 7th through the 10th. And it will be uh, Monday through Wednesday, 7.30 every night. Ray Hunter's a, a good gospel preacher. And it will benefit us uh, from time to time to support our sister congregations as they uh, do the work because we learn a lot from them and we're encouraged by them and also uh, we want them to support and encourage us when we have some works going on. Good to have our visitors. We say welcome to you and glad that you have taken time to visit and worship our God with us. In the first century, there was a slave by the name of Onesimus. His name means useful. In the first century, slavery was an established industry. It was not based upon skin color. It was not based upon nationality, really. Anyone of any race, of any skin color, could be a slave in the first century. And as Christianity was born on the day of Pentecost in around the year 33 A.D. It was born and spread into an empire which had at its very heart and soul slavery as its workforce. And during the process of time, as the Apostle Paul would go about and preach the gospel, he would preach to all people, as we will see a little bit later on. He was imprisoned around the year 60 A.D. And in his imprisonment, he came across a man by the name of Onesimus who turned out to be a runaway slave. His master's name was Philemon. They lived in the city of Colossae. The Lord's church met in Philemon's household. Evidently, Philemon was a wealthy individual he was wealthy enough to have a big enough house for the church to meet in it and also to have slaves. Onesimus ran away and ran away from his responsibility from Philemon. And when through the process of time, perhaps by God's providential hand, he came in contact with the Apostle Paul in prison. We're not told all the details of that circumstance. But the Apostle Paul preached to him the gospel. And Onesimus obeyed the gospel. He was baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of his sins. He became a Christian. And as a Christian, he had a responsibility. He had evidently stole something from Philemon or owed Philemon some money. We will see that in just a moment. And he had an obligation, he had a responsibility to go back to his former master and fulfill his obligation to Philemon. But under penalty of death, we find in the New Testament or in the first century law that if a slave did run away, Philemon by right, according to law, could have Onesimus put to death. He had that right to do so because... He was a runaway slave, and to do that could cost Onesimus his life. Onesimus had the responsibility to go back and wrong, or excuse me, right the wrongs that he did to his former master. So God saw fit to inspire the Apostle Paul to write this very short but powerful epistle that we find in our New Testament called the book of Philemon. It's very rare that we take an entire book and read and preach from it. We're going to do that this morning. The very short book of Philemon is very short, but yet it is very powerful in what it talks about. As I said earlier, Paul, by inspiration in prison, is inspired by the Holy Spirit of God to write this short letter, and he gives it to Onesimus so that when Onesimus returns to Philemon, he will return with this letter. 
as we will see in the letter, Paul is well acquainted with Philemon and the household of Philemon. And therefore, he is going to appeal to him in behalf of Onesimus to receive him back as a brother in Christ now. Philippians, or excuse me, Philemon, verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, verse 2, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. So as Onesimus returns and he gives this letter to Philemon, Philemon begins to read, and this from the Apostle Paul, that's the common greeting there, you find in verses uh, 1 through 3, he's addressing himself, he's describing himself as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He's in prison because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And because he is very familiar with the household, he doesn't even identify himself as an apostle. They're well aware of who it is. And so Paul, writing to Philemon, is uh, writing to him and calls him a beloved fellow worker and addresses Aphia, our sister, most likely Philemon's wife, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, most likely uh, their son, and the church in their house. The church met in their house. And gives the common greeting there in verse 3, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We learn here that Philemon is a, a beloved fellow worker. He was not just a church member. He was a fellow worker. Now I want you to think about this. If the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to you and addressed it to you and to your family, could he address you as a fellow worker and a fellow soldier or just a church member that just attends worship? There's a big difference. A fellow worker, a beloved fellow worker, and a soldier in the church that is in the house that meets there in Philemon's house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verses 4 through 7 we see the Apostle Paul is addressing Philemon and talking to him about uh, how he thinks God always concerning Philemon's faith. He says in verse 4, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus and all the saints. Verse 6, And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Verse 7, For I have derived much joy and comfort from you, or from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. So we see here that the Apostle Paul is addressing Philemon and saying, I, I thank God when I remember you in my prayers because of the type of person you are, because of the type of family that you have, because your love and your faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ is well known. You have a reputation of being a faithful Christian. You've opened your house up so the Lord's church could worship there, could assemble there. And he continues to pray for him in verse 6, that the sharing of his faith may be effective for the full knowledge of every good work that is for Christ's sake. And even though the Apostle Paul is in prison, because he has heard of the reputation and the work that they are doing there, he says he derives much joy, verse 7, and comfort from their love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through the work of that Philemon is doing. He's, in other words, complimenting him and encouraging him and saying, Philemon, you and your family are an encouragement to me. You bring joy and encouragement to me because I hear of your godly reputation and that you refresh the saints. You're a helper of the church. Not a hindrance, but a helper of the church. Verses 8 through the rest of the main body of the epistle, through verse 22, we see Paul appealing for uh, Onesimus to be received back. 
received back. Verse 8, Accordingly, though, I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required. Verse 9, Yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, the aged, and now I prisoner also of Jesus Christ. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, who I father, uh, whose father I become in my imprisonment. So he's saying here, I'm, I'm bold enough, verse 8, I have the authority as an apostle to command you to do this, but I'm not going to appeal to you that way. I'm going to appeal to you for love's sake. You see the tender uh, kindness of the Apostle Paul. He was not an authoritarian dictator. He had the authority of an apostle, but yet he's saying, I'm not going to exercise this, uh, but for love's sake, I'm going to appeal to you. And the reason why he could do that is because he knew the character of Philemon. He knew Philemon was a receptive person to the will of God. And he says, I'm an old man, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, that meant his child in the faith, not his biological child. Verse 11, formerly he was useless to you, but now indeed useful to you and to me. I converted him in my imprisonment. He became useless to you because he ran away. He's a runaway slave. He did you wrong. His name, Onesimus, means useful. But now that he has been converted, he has changed. He has changed. Keep that in mind. We'll come back to that thought in just a moment. He has changed now, and now I want you to receive him back. He's useful to me, but I want him to send him back to you, verse 12. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. Verse 13. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order, that, in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own free will. In other words, I, I would like to keep Onesimus with me. He's very helpful to me. But I don't want to do anything without your consent because I want you to do it out of your own free will. Verse 15 for this perhaps is why he departed from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother. Especially to me, but how much more to you both in the flesh and in the Lord. Verse 15, you see the Apostle Paul's uh, comment here about providence. And I want you to notice that even by inspiration, the Apostle Paul says, perhaps this happened for this reason. Perhaps he ran away from you so that he could come into contact with me and thus come into contact with the gospel of Christ and thus become a Christian. So that he might return to you, Philemon. He's no longer just a slave. He's now your brother in Christ. And he is uh, very helpful to you, as he was helpful to me. And I'm, and I'm sending him back to you so that he might be helpful once again to right the wrongs that he has done. Verse 17, so, I, so you consider me, your partner, receive him as you would receive me. So he's saying, you receive Onesimus the way you would receive me if I were coming to visit you. And I want you to notice the equality that's there. And we'll talk about that in just a moment as well. He's no longer a slave. He's a brother in Christ. And Philemon, you receive him back as though you were receiving me. Equality. Verse 19, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it uh, to say nothing of your uh, owing me even your own self, or uh, skip verse 18, if he has wronged you at all, or if he owes you anything, charge that on my account. And Paul says, I'm writing this with my own hand. I'll repay it. And to say nothing of your owing me even your own self. So Paul is saying, whatever he owes you, whatever he took from you, whatever he stole from you, whatever the problem is, I'll pay for it. I'll deal with it. And so he says to Philemon, 
uh, I'll repay this, but uh, remember, you owe me even your own self. So Paul is kind of reminding him, remember that I probably, referring to their conversion, remember I brought the gospel to you. I don't think Paul ever received a bill for what was owed. I don't think that ever happened. Verse 20, Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Refresh there. So he would be refreshed knowing that Philemon would receive Onesimus back as a brother in Christ. Verse 21, Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Here, Paul is confident in, in Philemon's doing the right thing and obeying the will of the Lord and say, I know that you're even going to do more than that. Verse 22, at the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. He says, when I get out of prison, when I'm released from this, Philemon, I'm going to come see you. I'm going to come see you and visit you. So prepare a room for me. Verse 23 through 25, we have the closing remarks. Apophis, my fellow prisoner in Christ, Jesus sends uh, greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with your spirit. Of course, Mark is the one who wrote the gospel according to Mark. And of course, Luke is the one who wrote the gospel according to Luke and the book of Acts. So he finally wraps up the epistle and says in verse 25, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. He starts off by talking about grace in verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And he ends the epistle by talking about God's grace. So here you have Onesimus, probably with great apprehension and fear, returning to his former master, knowing that his former master would have every right to have him executed under Roman law. But yet he is carrying this epistle with him, written by the Spirit of God through the instrumentality of Paul, and given it to him, and Philemon being a person who was receptive to the will of God, I believe obeyed wholeheartedly and received Onesimus back not as just a slave, but as a beloved brother in Christ. What are some lessons we can learn from this very short and powerful epistle? The first thing that I learn is, number one, the gospel is for all. The gospel is for all. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, the Hebrew writer says, But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that He, by the grace of God, might taste of death for everyone. Everyone. Christ suffered and died on the cross for everyone. That means the lowliest of slave and the most high-ranking king and everyone in between. Jesus Christ tasted of death he suffered and died for everyone. This gospel, this good news, is for everyone. It doesn't matter their economic background. It doesn't matter the color of their skin. It doesn't matter whether they're in bondage or whether they're free. This message is for all. And Paul realized that. That's why Paul would be willing to preach before kings, before an emperor, before those who are governors, and to a slave by the name of Onesimus. He understood the importance of the gospel and that everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3 and verse 23. And everyone needs the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God and the salvation. Romans 1 and verse 16. What a lesson that we need to understand that we need to know that the gospel is for everyone. Not just people who look like us and talk like us, but for people who are different than us. And we should not be willing to withhold the gospel from anyone, but be willing to teach and preach to everyone, as the Apostle Paul was willing to do. Second thing I learned is that when a person enters into Christ, 
everyone is equal. Remember what Paul said? You receive Onesimus back as though you were receiving me. Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ. But he saw himself on an equal plane with this slave, Onesimus. And he told Philemon, you don't receive him back anymore just as a slave. He's now your brother in Christ. You're equal. You see, God in His wisdom did not tell the slaves of the first century, you rebel against your masters. He did not tell the masters, you release all of your slaves. He changed their relationship and put them on equal footing. And naturally, slavery would dissolve. As a result of that, Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 through 28, the Apostle Paul says, For as many of us as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Verse 28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. All one. Whether, whether you're slave or free, whether you're in bondage or whether you're a master, you are one in Christ Jesus. The gospel of Christ is the great equalizer. We all need it. And when we obey it, we enter into the same church. And in the same church, we're all equal. It doesn't mean we all have the same function. But we are all equal. We are all one in Christ. And the third thing that I learned from this very powerful but yet short epistle is the gospel changes relationships. The gospel, when it is received, when God's word is received into a person's heart and they obey it and they become a Christian, it changes relationships. And we're going to see that from the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15 it makes us a new person. And as a new person, we have new relationships. It makes everything better as far as relationships are concerned. That doesn't mean we don't receive persecution from those who don't want to do God's will. It doesn't mean we don't re receive resistance from those who are antagonistic to Christ and His way. But it does improve relationships. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12-15 through 15, Paul says, therefore, as the elect of God, or the chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, verse 13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against the other, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do, verse 14. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of per perfection, verse 15, and let the peace of God Rule in your hearts to which you were also called in one body and be thankful. You put on these qualities. You're the chosen of God. You, you bear with one another. You be forgiving towards one another. And you above all put on love. You're in the same body. You're in the same institution that belongs to Christ. You're equal now. And you are to behave the way Christ would have you behave. Colossians 3, verses 18 through chapter 4 and verse 1. It changes and betters relationship. The gospel of Christ does. Colossians 3, and verse 18. Wives, submit to your own husbands as it is fitting to the Lord. It will make better wives. Verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. It will make better husbands. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is the will of the Lord. It will make better children. Verse 21, Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. It will make better fathers and better parents. Verse 22, Bond servants or slaves, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, Fearing God, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Verse 25, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, 
And there is no partiality. It makes better slaves. You put it into our context today. It makes better workers. Because they will be diligent to do the Lord's will because they realize, as this principle is found here, you're ultimately serving Christ. You're ultimately serving God. And you must remember that. But notice uh, chapter 4 and verse 1. The master's responsibility. Masters, give your bond servants or your slaves what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. It makes better masters. In our context, it makes better bosses or better employers. Because you're going to treat your workers right. You're going to do what's fair because you know you have a master in heaven. It changes relationships for the better. The gospel of Christ always will do that. Onesimus had a responsibility. He could not just shun his responsibility now that he was a Christian. He had to go back to Philemon and wrong what was right and renew that relationship, but understanding that it's different. They're now one in Christ. They're now brethren in the Lord. The book of Philemon has many, many wonderful lessons in it. And we've only touched the hem of the garment. But if you're not a Christian this morning, you have, by the grace and mercy of God, another opportunity to, to be one in Christ. To, to leave the things of the world and become a child of God. If you believe in Christ with all, all your heart and you're willing to confess that verbally, willing to repent of your sins, we can baptize you this morning, immerse you in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and the blood of Christ will remove all your transgressions, and He will add you to His one body. If you've done that, you've gone astray, you've gone back into darkness, repent and come back to Him. As always, the choice is yours while we stand, while we sing.